الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Dear and respected brothers and sisters in Islam This is a very important video about the Muslim perspective on the current war happening between Russia and Ukraine Who should we side with as Muslims? Is this going to be the beginning of a World War III? And many other questions, insha'Allah ta'ala, that we will be answering in this very important video. However, I just want to let you know in advance that as you realized through the duration of the video, this is going to be a long video. We have no choice. This is a big issue. This is a big matter and we have to be informed as Muslims. We have to know what is the position of Islam on this. What, Where should we stand exactly? I did my best to try to summarize the content, to cut off some of the points that I wanted to cover, but uh, we still have to understand, you know, I would really advise you insha'Allah to take your time to fully focus on the content that we will be covering insha'Allah if you don't have the time to watch this video in one shot completely you can watch it you know in two halves in two different times however make sure insha'Allah that you watch the video first of all and make sure if you benefit from this video make sure please this is extremely important this is nasiha for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the rest of our brothers and sisters in Islam make sure you share it with everyone that you know not only on social media but even your personal contacts your families and friends and so on and so forth because we need to spread awareness people they need to know uh, what are the Islamic answers about this because as you realize you know it's hard nowadays to find these kind of answers as we will cover them insha'Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we will be covering a lot of points however I just want to let you know right now that I'm not going to talk much about things like uh, you know the double standard that we see nowadays when it comes to how Muslims are ignored when conflicts are happening in their lands, when they are the ones suffering, they are being ignored by the media and the politicians and so on and so forth. I'm not going to get too much into that. I know that people are interested to hear a lot of, about that. However, I'm not getting much into that for, me, for, for many reasons. First of all, because this has already been covered and I think everyone has realized nowadays, you know, the level of hypocrisy and contradiction that we see in the world in which we live nowadays. Uh, so I want to focus on other more important practical questions because as Muslims, we cannot always uh, just be complainers, you know, whiners we complain that they don't like us let's focus this time inshallah ta'ala on valuing ourselves on uh, on building our future as an ummah of muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam rather than being you know too busy with what others are thinking about us and how others are being wrong toward us or they are being hypocritical and so on and so forth this doesn't matter that much because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَإِن تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا لَا يَضُرُّكُمْ كَيْدُهُمْ شَيْئًا We have to focus on building ourselves as an ummah and the rest will come by itself insha'Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But please again, I just wanted to remind you it's very important to share this kind of content. Uh, I will make the video available in Arabic, in English and I will do my best insha'Allah. It takes a lot of time. It took me a lot of time, hours to prepare this content and to structure it and go through it and so on and so forth. And it takes me time also to record it, to produce it. So I will do my best, inshallah, to also record a French version of this video due to the importance of the uh, topic that is being covered. Let's start with one hadith, one or two hadith of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in the authentic hadith, authentic narration in Sahih Al Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said this hadith of Abu Huraira as well as Abu Sa'id Al Khudri. The hour, the end of times will not happen. Before, so the Prophet him here is mentioning some of the signs of the end of times. And he says, Ali He said, Ali Salaam, that among the signs of the end of times, you have the multiplication, the duhur, meaning it will become so common to be facing fitan. Al-fitan, which is the plural of a fitna. We'll talk about fitna later on, inshallah ta'ala. Fitan are situations where people, they get tested very hardly, very big tests that people will be facing. Tests that come with confusion, with conflicts and 
uh, differences and so on and so forth, division. These are called al-fitan. And then he says Ali Salam. So he goes hand in hand. He mentioned Ali Salam. Another sign of the end of times. He said Ali Salam. Yuqbadu al-ilmu. Knowledge will disappear. Knowledge will become very rare. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is not talking about knowledge that we call nowadays science. You know, knowledge that we learn at university, we go to the library. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is talking about the knowledge of the deen, the knowledge of Islam, the knowledge of the religion. Because that's the most important knowledge. Knowledge of the akhirah, of the hereafter, of fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowledge of knowing what the hudud, the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are. Because those limits, they were set by our creator, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by God, the one who created this universe. And only him has the full right to tell us where those limits should be because as human beings, you know, if every one of us was to uh, make up his own way of living, how societies, how this world, how uh, human beings should interact, how countries should have, uh, should, uh, should take care of their conflicts and differences of opinion and so on and so forth, Everyone will have his own way, right? And everyone will say that it's either my way or the highway. I set the boundaries here. Someone else will want to step over my boundaries and set those boundaries, his boundaries, way closer than me. So who has the right answer? This is going to be a per perpetual, uh, you know, a state of conflict and problems and so on and so forth that's why allah Azza wa Jal has sent down prophets and messengers starting from adam السلام, and then you know including nuh السلام, ibrahim السلام, prophet moses musa السلام, jesus isa السلام, david Dawood, and so on and so forth the last one of them being prophet muhammad وسلم, all of those prophets they were sent by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to tell us where are the limits where are the limits that uh, define basically our rights as well as duties either when it comes to us as individuals but also societies and communities and nations and so on and so forth so prophet muhammad sallallahu he said science will or knowledge of the deen will become very difficult to find it will be a lot of most people will become so ignorant that's why he said والسلام, ignorance will will be seen will be present everywhere people they don't know the hudud of allah Azza wa they don't know what's halal what's haram they don't know how to live properly in this universe how to interact as human beings whether it's inside for example a household with in a family so families get destroyed as we see nowadays whether it's in business in politics and also wars right so that's why he says والسلام, one of the signs of the end of times that he mentioned also in this hadith he says والسلام, and there will be a lot of harj the sahaba the companions they said what is harj ya rasulullah because here he just mentioned a word from the habasha it's not an arabic word al harj is not an arabic word so the Prophet ﷺ to clarify, he said, Al Hart is Al Qatl, Al Qatl is killing, killing, killing. There will be a lot of killing. This will be one of the signs of the end of times. Huge conflicts and wars and battles and so on and so forth. And to illustrate more the nature and the character of those killings that will be ha happening by the end of times, in the other hadith also, authentic hadith of Prophet Muhammad wasallam, he says والسلام, that this world will not end before a day will come. It will be a time during which the one killing will not know why he killed. And the one being killed, the victim, will not know why they were killed. And this is exactly the character of conflict and war nowadays, especially with technology, the madness of modern technology, which has allowed for very easy, massive destruction. War has become dehumanized as we see it nowadays. Because with a single button, someone, you know, sitting in a room or in a fighter jet, from miles away, they can kill tons of people. 
and they don't get to see any damage, right? They don't see the consequence. You know, back in the days, people, they did war. They had to go to the battlefield and kill their enemy. They will see a human being dying right in front of them. Nowadays, it's not the case anymore because the one killing again with a machine, with a button, giving orders over the phone or over, you know, some some technology interface, they don't get to see the damage. They don't get to see the consequence. They only read the reports after they get numbers and information and so on and so forth and then they go back to sleep in their home right so this dehumanizes war and also you know nowadays there's no longer a need for the uh, traditional commander or leader of a battle again back in the days when people nations when they clashed when they faced each other the one making the decision for war most of the time you know they had to be a brave person, a strong person that had to actually go by themselves to lead the army into the battlefield, right? They had to carry a sword to, to put their life at risk. Nowadays, again, we have a lot of leaders that uh, send their own army to a, uh, to a war somewhere else. But they don't get to, to face the consequences right away. They don't put their own life in risk, which made it that, you know, war nowadays has become so easy and has become so dangerous that in a moment like this, right, so much destruction can be caused. subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why one point that I already want to mention in the beginning of this hadith or in the beginning of this video, I'm sorry unless there's some sort of a miracle what do i mean by a miracle you know something from allah Azza wa Jal, a sudden global shortage of electricity and fuel and power that would cancel much of the technology that we have nowadays unless something like that happens okay which is pretty unlikely that it will happen allah ta'ala if that if that doesn't happen you know that one big disaster call it a world war whatever you want to call it but that one big disaster is definitely going to happen one day it's not an issue of if it's happening or not the question is when exactly allah ta'ala alam allah knows best will it be this one we don't know allah ta'ala alam or is this current war between russia and ukraine just another warning another sign from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we'll talk about this in a moment, inshallah. What do we mean by a sign from Allah? We'll talk about this in a moment, inshallah. Ta'ala. Allah ta'ala a'lam. So again, a lot of people, they are asking this question, is this going to lead to World War Three? Some people, they say, no, no, this is not going to happen. Some other people, they say, yes, this is going to happen. There is no doubt about it. The answer is maybe, maybe not. Allahu a'lam. No person knows for sure what's about to happen no no nobody can guarantee to you what's about to happen in the next few weeks in the next few months this is completely out of control this is pretty random right except by the qadr and the will of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nobody can just like plan something like this and say you know i have a plan and this is what we are going to do because you have superpowers here and everyone they have their own plans their own values their own way of dealing with this situation Allah Ta'ala A'lam what this equation is going to give as a result in the end of the day. What I can tell you is probably none of these leaders and none of these nations, even the people who are currently involved in war, nobody wants a World War III with the technology that we have today. Why? Because again, this is not traditional wars anymore, right? With the technology that we have nowadays, a World War III three would mean a destruction of half of this world and nobody can be fully protected from this so even those people that are making war today they know that if this war gets out of hand right they will be threatened their own families will be threatened because again i don't have to go into the details right i'm sure everybody has uh, has some knowledge about you know how destructive the modern technology has has become and people they watch even movies nowadays and novels about it and so on and so forth and we have in the quran in the book of allah an ayah that serves as an indication 
about a very important principle in life. Allah says, "Wala yakhafu uqbah." What is "Wala yakhafu uqbah"? Allah does not fear the consequences of his actions when he sends down the adab. The scholars they say it means that you know accept Allah Azza wa Jal. Believe me, okay. This you have to know this because a lot of people they are they are um, uh, used to hearing a lot of. Um, exaggerated conspiracy theories about you know some some group of people that they make plans for the world and it always worked as planned and they have the complete control over how events happen and so on and so forth this you know this is a big problem this goes against our aqidah or tawheed believing in the qadr but let me tell you one thing everyone in this world even the most powerful people right even the the guy sitting in the house and in, in the in the white house and the other guy sitting in russia and so on and so forth every one of them there's a certain limit after which they fear for they fear the consequences of their actions they don't know uh, what the consequences will be that's why only allah subhanahu wa ta'ala god he is the only one that Whatever he writes in the decree, in the Qadr, whatever he decides and he wills, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does not fear the consequences. Everyone else, even the brave and strong people, yes, they fear less consequences than the common person outside on the street. But, you know, there's a certain limit after which they are scared to take some decisions, right? Because they can, again, they, they, can, they can pay for it. They can pay very hardly for it. But let's just make it clear here. Uh, if you look at history, right, full-scale conflicts, full-scale conflicts like World One, uh, World War One, and World War Two, usually they become they happen not because it was planned, right? N nobody goes out like this and says, "Ah, today I'm I'm planning to trigger the a, a world war." Only a foolish, crazy, mad person would do this, right? Someone with no relatives, no family, no friend. Because just think about this. All of these leaders around the world, right? Even those who are crazy, and some of them, they are crazy for sure. They have families, they have friends, they have uh, business partners, and so on and so forth. And there's pressure on them, right? To not take some decisions, to, to, uh, to, uh, to stop at a certain limit. But a full-scale conflict can still happen because of a single mistake, because of a miscalculation. One event that can trigger a mad escalation that goes completely out of control. And the longer this conflict is going to last, the more dangerous it will become for mankind because at a certain point, something might happen, one event, and it will be the point of no return. It will be one of the two sides or more will have to be completely crushed before this is completely over. However, what is extremely likely to happen is two things. So as I told you, is this going to be to be a global, you know, full scale conflict? Allahu alam, and Allah Allah knows best, right? If you tell me, I can tell you fifty percent yes, fifty percent no. But what I can tell you is there are two things that are highly likely to happen if this lasts for a few more weeks. If this is not uh, basically resolved, you know, ASAP. First of all. It is very likely <clears throat> that we will be facing what I can call an electronic pandemic, electronic viruses. Think about this. In the past two years, our lives were shaken by COVID, right? Those were our physical lives with restrictions and business problems and inflation and so on and so forth. So our lives, physical lives were disturbed. Something will happen at a certain point in the near future whether it's because of this or something that comes after the ukraine russia situation but i strongly believe i really believe that something will happen pretty soon that will shake and disturb our digital lives not our physical lives that was the first step second step is the digital life and what I mean by this is what the scholars and the experts, they call the cyber warfare. There's a war, there's a word for this called cyber war. So we have the war outside, which kills people, but there's cyber war nowadays can also kill masses of people, can destroy much of the civilization that we have nowadays that we are used to. So you might wake up one morning and there is no internet. 
right? You might say, what's the problem with that? It's not just like, you know, you have no internet, you can't, you can't access your Facebook to see who has put likes on it and so on and so forth. When we say there's no internet, it means you will not have access to a lot of resources. You might go to the bank and they say, we don't have money, we can't give you your money. The bank is actually closed. Uh, you might, we might be facing, you know, shortages of electricity. There's no power. There's no power. There's no heating. There's no, and this, especially in the West, right? In the countries which are so connected, as we say, the world is connected. So in other poorer countries, the, the, uh, the effects will be pretty limited, but in the extremely connected digital countries, like it is the case in the West and the Gulf countries and so on and so forth, this will cause a lot of disturbance. This will really uh, change our lives for, you know, Allah Ta'ala A'lam. In which way exactly? Allah Ta'ala A'lam. And this, by the way, this has been happening already. Cyber war has existed for years, except that, you know, you don't hear about it much on the news because, you know, the Russians, the Iranians, the Chinese, the Americans, all of these people, they, 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 they attack each other. They, they do cyber war. But, you know, they, they used to respect a certain limit they don't go beyond a certain limit. they just want to prove a point but if this becomes a, a full-scale war again or something close to this right it is going to go to the next level it is going to go to the next level and of course i don't have to tell you what the consequences can be on everyone's life everybody now especially in the west people they work from home they work you know people they have businesses online they they live off the internet so imagine if one day wake up and there is no internet or some of the internet is cut off right some some major websites will be cut off some regions in the world will not have access to the internet i'm not going into the technicalities of how would this happen right you can find a lot of things on the internet a lot of articles that experts and scholars have written about this number two the second thing that can happen very likely if this conflict lasts for a long time is what we can describe as a big major lack of availability availability of goods as well as services think about how there can be a limited supply of goods from cargo ships right if if these uh, if this regional war uh, will 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 turn in a way that you know some cargo ships will be uh, will be uh, will be targeted uh, will not feel safe anymore traveling through the oceans and the waters and so on and so forth. This will delay, this will increase the prices, this will decrease the availability, the luxury that we have nowadays. Uh, maybe we will become unable, it will be uh, not possible for us to travel abroad, to take the plane, to certain locations, to certain destinations, or for certain periods of time, because they will say, you know, this month is not very safe for us to allow, you know, any plane to, to leave this country, for example, to go to Europe, to go into that direction. I remember a few years ago, just because of a volcano, just a volcano, right? It completely disturbed the the air traffic so imagine you know what would happen if there's like a war that you know involves like at least three four five six countries this is definitely going to have an impact on our lives elsewhere because we live in the era of globalization that's the world in which we live uh, in nowadays unfortunately so no one knows exactly what can happen next if you you know if you have one of your friends that sits down with you and tells you you know this is i'm, I'm going to tell you what's, what's about to happen or if you turn on the tv and you find this uh guy that you know looks like a very confident expert that knows everything and that's telling you this is what's going to happen they are just telling you nonsense right we can speculate we can uh, out of knowledge, of course, when someone has the knowledge, depending on the the level of um, information that they have at their disposal, as Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala used to say, "Inna dhunnu illa dhannan, wa ma nahnu bimustaqinin." This is a situation of dhun, right? You, you, you can't give a final, full answer, one hundred percent. But one thing is clear. One thing has to be clear for us. So here, I'm trying to mix a little bit of politics and you know uh, the situation of the world events but also with our aqidah because as muslims we don't just look at events we look at what's behind the events right what's the message from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how does it impact our iman because we believe in qadr we believe in hikmah the wisdom of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so one thing is clear is that the world will not be the same anymore 
we got the first message. We got it first with the COVID. Now this is being confirmed, right? Allah Azza wa is sending us messages here that the world is about to change. It's not going to be the world that we were used to back in the days anymore. Why? Because as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, ظَهَرَ الْفَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِ النَّاسِ لِيُذِيقَهُمْ بَعْضَ الَّذِي عَمِلُوا لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ When corruption happens, when there's a lot of fasad, it's because of our own actions as human beings. Why? Not because Allah Azza wa Jal is necessarily you know, uh, punishing us just for the sake of punishing us. Allah Azza wa Jal, sometimes He punishes people or He tests people to remind them that they go back to him. They make tawbah. This is a reminder. This is an alert, right? Watch out. This is a warning. Be careful because you're going the wrong way, right? And we are starting to lose much of the comfort of life, the luxury, the freedom that we were used to. Again, think about the pre-COVID world. And now we are going to probably start talking about the pre-war, right? The pre-war era, how we used to live before the war. Because when you get too spoiled as a human being, as a person, when you get too pampered, what happens? You misuse the blessings, the ni'am of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what us as human beings, we have done to ourselves nowadays in this era in which we live. Let's... Uh, talk here about a few ayat and hadith very important because again I, I don't want to make this you know a very cold content just about politics it's very important for us always to link whatever happens our lives to link all of that to the book of Allah to hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the famous dua he used to make in his dua ask Allah azza wa jal wa a'udhu bika min zawali ni'matika wa tahawuli afiyatika he used to ask Allah to protect him just like we say a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim may Allah protect me against shaytan rajim we also ask Allah that he protects us from tahawulun ni'mah or zawalun ni'mah what is zawalun ni'mah is uh, blessings being taken care of us uh, being taken away from us losing blessings when you don't have blessings it's a problem but a bigger problem is when you have a lot of blessings and then suddenly they disappear they are being taken away from you why we will see in a moment inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the quran kareem we can uh, find ayat that talk to us about the problem of abusing of the ni'mah what do we mean by abusing of the ni'mah misusing it Allah Azza wa Jal gives me a ni'mah, a blessing, and I misuse it. I abuse of it. I deserve that the ni'mah be taken away from me. I don't deserve it anymore because it becomes a ni'mah, it becomes dangerous for me, and sometimes it becomes also dangerous for others. The fact that I'm having that blessing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, كُلُوا مِنْ طَيِّبَاتِ مَا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ وَلَا تَطْغَوْ فِيهِ فَيَحِلَّ عَلَيْكُمْ غَضَبِي وَمَنْ يَحْلِلْ عَلَيْهِ غَضَبِي فَقَدْ هَوَى وَإِنِّي لَغَفَّارٌ إِلَىٰ آخِرِ الْآيَةِ Allah Azza wa Jal says when he talks about the ni'mah of food وَلَا تَطْغَوْ فِيهِ Do not abuse of the ni'mah Do not abuse of the blessing What is abusing of the blessing? Again, misusing it or forgetting Allah not being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not paying zakat not paying charity not taking care of those who are in need and so on and so forth because if you abuse of the ni'mah Allah Azza wa Jal says فَيَحِلَّ عَلَيْكُمْ غَضَبِي and the anger of Allah, the adab of Allah will come down on you. Someone who is facing the anger, the ghadab of Allah Azza wa Jal, they will be in trouble. But right after this, the ayah, وَإِنِّي لَغَفَّارُ لِمَنْ تَابَ Allah Azza wa Jal talks again about the doors of repentance, about tawbah being open. Even if someone misuses the, the ni'mah, they can still repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before it is too late. We have the famous ayah also in the Quran, Al-Kareem, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ this is an ayah that we quote a lot. A lot of people, they quote this ayah on a regular basis. But usually when people, they quote this ayah, they they uh, understand it in a way that's uh, that's not the most precise. Because the tafsir of, you know, the, the most popular tafsir of, of this ayah is what? That Allah Azawad, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ مِنَ النِّعْمَةِ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ فَيُحْدِثُ 
kufranan fayuhtithu ma'siyatan Allah Azza wa Jal does not change the state of a nation of people of community from the better to the worst until they change their own selves meaning if you see that someone is losing the ni'mah losing the blessings they are getting downgraded in life they they had such a beautiful life and then suddenly you know they're losing everything this is a big sign that they have done something wrong they have done something wrong because allah azza wa jal says the rule Allah Azza wa Jal states it in the Quran. If you are being grateful, if we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the ni'am, what happens? He increases us in blessings. He doesn't take them away from us. He gives us better. Which doesn't mean, of course, that we won't get tested on the way. Sometimes you can lose some of the ni'mah. This is a test from Allah. But if someone, you know, is just losing the blessings just like that, you know, in there's no there's no explanation to it. It's because they have um they have disobeyed Allah Azza wa Jal. They are the ni'mah, the blessing is corrupting them. Iyadan billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because we are talking about war and because we are talking about a global change and a global uh, disappearing of the ni'am, the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's take for example technology, how it has become so ugly, technology which is a blessing from Allah, it was a, it, uh, you know, a blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us, you know, the ability to have planes, to travel, to have cars, to have uh, the internet and phones that we can call relatives and friends and ask for services and order food and so on and so forth, this is amazing, alhamdulillah, we can do business, you know, worldwide, this is amazing, such a ni'mah, but we have abused of it, we took it to the next level. We went beyond the limits of the reason of its existence, right? So think about how corrupt the social media has become, right? Everybody knows this. Think about how our lives have become like robots because of, you know, digital footprints and Al-Qadimu A'zam. They are planning for even worse things, right? Well, we are just about to become just numbers in this world. You're just going to become a number, basically, a code or a number or a card that your whole life is going to be tracked a'udhu billah what is this what is this like is this the is this like dajjal working on his system what is it exactly this is the demise of technology this is we are witnessing i personally believe wallahu alam that we are living the demise this is technology you know it reached its optimal point now it's going to start going down how allahu alam but this is about to go down because we have we are misusing it so much I remember personally, you know, back in the end of the 90s and beginning of the 2000s, the internet was a great thing. It was this beautiful thing that we had, that you just go to the internet sometimes to send email, you know, to friends and relatives and to uh, most of the, of course they had, you know, bad things and haram things on the internet from the very beginning, but most of the content, most of the use was what? People using the internet to, to learn beneficial things, right? You, you can find articles, you can find, you can exchange information. Look at the internet, how, how, you know, how, how destructive it has become, how destructive. Think about its effects on people, how it has destroyed families, has destroyed, you know, people, they are addicted to a screen. Uh, and this is a completely different topic. I don't want to get too much into the details because we have more important things to talk about. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, for example, in the Quran Karim, let me mention two examples very briefly. The example of Quraysh, we know Surah Quraysh, all of us. فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ الَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفٍ So Allah is talking to us about the ni'mah that Allah has given to Quraysh. The ni'mah of what? Ni'mah of security, safety. You are secure, you are safe. Alhamdulillah. And you have food. You can provide for yourself, for your children. أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ You're not hungry at night. You can, alhamdulillah, eat. This is great ni'mah. What should you do? فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ Then they should worship Allah. You should, they should be grateful toward their Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to deny His ni'am, not to misuse His ni'am. Talking about misusing the ni'am of Allah, there's also very, interested, very interesting ayat, verses of the Qur'an in Surah Saba. I'm not going to cover uh, the whole thing here. It's going to take us a lot of time. 
go back to Surah Sabah, Surah Sabah in the book of Allah Azza wa Jal, and you know, probably the third page of the Surah or something, you're going to find the ayat about when Allah Azza wa Jal says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لِسَبَئٍ فِي مَسْكَنِهِمْ آيَةً جَنَّتَانِ عَنْ يَمِينِ وَشِمَالِ كُلُوا مِنْ رِزْقِ رَبِّكُمْ وَاشْكُرُوا لَهُ بَلْدَةٌ طَيِّبَةٌ وَرَبٌّ غَفُورٌ فَأَعْرَضُوا فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ سَيْلَ الْعَالِمِ وَبَدَّلْنَاهُمْ بِجَنَّتَيْهِمْ جَنَّتَيْنِ ذَوَاتَيْ أُكُلٍ خَمْطٍ وَأَثْلٍ وَشَيْءٍ مِنْ سِدْرٍ قَلِيلٍ ذَلِكَ جَزَيْنَاهُمْ بِمَا كَفَرُوا وَهَلْ نُجَازِي إِلَّا الْكَفُورَ وَجَعَلْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ وَبَيْنَ الْقُرَى الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا قُرًى ظَاهِرَةً وَقَدَّرْنَا فيها السير سيروا فيها ليالي وأياما آمنين فقالوا ربنا باعد بين أسفارنا وظلموا أنفسهم فجعلناهم أحاديث ومزقناهم كل ممزق إن في ذلك لآيات لكل صبار شكور الله عز وجل in these ayat is talking to us about how many blessings he gave to the people of Saba جنتين gardens and so on so forth but what did they do أعرضوا they they were not grateful they were ungrateful to Allah and Allah عز وجل took the ni'am away from them but one interesting thing we have here in this in these ayat that's why that's why i quoted the whole the whole block of ayat here allah azza wa said here i'm just making it very brief allah azza wa mentioned how he made their trips very safe they had the ability to travel the people of of uh, of uh, of, of Saba, to travel in safety in security and they had also, uh, you know, they they had basically, they had supply everywhere when they were traveling. They had an easy life, easy way to travel like we have nowadays. You want to travel, you can take the plane and they serve you meals. Beautiful life. However, subhanAllah, look how, how crazy, how mad we can be as human beings. They said, Ya Allah, this is too beautiful of a life. رَبَّنَا بَاعِدْ بَيْنَ أَسْفَارِنَا Ya Allah, can you please make like our trips like longer, more difficult, right? Uh, basically, um, we, we want to have more, more space, more distance between the different stations that we can maybe suffer a little bit. It's subhanAllah, it's like if, we, it's like if a lot of people nowadays, they are like the people of Saba. They have everything that they just want to try something new where, can, where they can suffer a little bit. And that's why a lot of people, they're actually ready for war. They want, they want to see war, right? Because they are just too used to the na'am, to the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they don't really know what war is about, what conflict, what suffering is exactly about. They just heard about it. They think it's something fun, right? That they can try. Let's talk now about how we made this crazy and sudden move from COVID to war. We were in COVID mode and then right away, within a few hours, we forgot COVID and we went to war, right? I personally expected COVID to end by this summer and I already have written about this. I expected that COVID would end by the summer. Omicron will be kind of the end of COVID. And I just want to make sure here to mention one thing, okay? We don't know the ghaib. We don't know the unseen. Everything that I talk about here, I'm not saying, you know, I'm good at predictions. I know the future. Only Allah Azza wa knows the future, right? We don't know the ghaib for sure. If someone says this is how it's going to happen in the future, they are lying to you. This is shirk billah Azza wa Jal. But we, what we say here, it's like weather forecast, right? It's like the weather forecast. 70-80% of possibility of chance is enough to be taken seriously. When you say that tomorrow, 70%, 80% chance of heavy rain. You're going to take this seriously because you're going to say have to have to cover well and so on and so forth. But you don't know the ghaib. Same thing. I don't know the future. But I expected COVID to end by this summer. And COVID was a fitna. COVID was a fitna. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi talked to us about the fitna. Well, COVID was a fitna. What do I mean? I'm not talking about the virus, the illness here, okay? I'm not getting into the whole debate whether COVID was real or fake, whether you believe it was real, you don't believe. Regardless, we all agree on one thing. There was something big that happened around the world called the COVID situation. COVID has brought lockdowns, civil disturbance and unrest has destroyed families right divorce and domestic problems so has uh, destroyed businesses it has it changed the world completely we all agree on this <clears throat> so i'm talking about covid not as an illness here i'm talking about covid as a phase two years that mankind they went through 
COVID was a fitna. Why I'm saying COVID was a fitna? Because a lot of people, that's exactly what a fitna is. Fitna, when there's, when there's a lot of confusion, fake news, different opinions, people, they become divided, right? And fitna usually, they uh, have as a consequence, one of the most dangerous consequences of fitna. And please listen to this. That's why we have to be very careful to ask Allah Azza wa for thabat. Na'udhu billahi min al fitan. That's why Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us to ask Allah to protect us from fitan, different fitan. Why? Because, for example, in COVID, people, they have changed their values, including values of the deen, right? Some people, they uh, even some people, of they have certain amount of knowledge. They actually went as far as, you know, issuing a fatwa to say it's, you know, yeah, it's an obligation to close the masjid. It's haram to pray in jama'ah at the masjid. Are you crazy? Are you insane? Are you foolish? They must be looking at themselves right now and just like feeling so embarrassed, right? That they, they, they went that far. Looking back, right? It was not the, it was not the plague. It was not the end of the world. As it was illustrated that it would, it might become. Think about how many people made enemies because of COVID, right? You made enemies for what? We we had in our own masajid. This applies to everybody, but I'm just giving you the example here of where us as Muslims were supposed to have the best behavior, best conduct, the most. You have to be rational, have to have hikmah, right? We have to have sabr, patience, good akhlaq. Is when we are inside the masjid, the house of Allah. We had people fighting sometimes even inside masjids. People made enemies inside the masjid. Why? Because, brother, you're praying. Uh, you're not praying two meters away from me. Step back. Brother, uh, the wudu. You can't make wudu in the masjid. Brother, don't touch the mushaf, right? Brother, uh, there's a limit here. We can't add one more person. You made enemies, right? You're going to face this. Yawm al qiyamah. You, this is going to come back on you. You'll have. It's not like COVID is over, right? You, you will have to face Allah Azza wa Jalla with this and to answer, why? You fought for an exaggerated for an overrated cause i don't believe covid was fake by the way okay but i'm not going to detail this right now but i believe that just like we see it today to a certain extent it was overrated as as a problem as a cause it was a bit exaggerated right i'm not getting into again whether this was intentional or it was just you know a miscalculation but it was a fitna confusion ignorance fake news different you know getting contradictory information so on and so forth this is a fitna this is where you get lost when you don't have knowledge you don't have hikmah and you also you don't have fear of allah you don't have a strong level of iman you don't ask allah azawajal to protect you subhanahu wa ta'ala and by the way subhanallah you know i wanted this was in my plans to make a series of videos about the end of COVID, looking back at the whole COVID situation, what went wrong, what are the conclusions, the lessons that we should derive as Muslims, I was really preparing for this. But look, suddenly, we didn't even have the time to breathe, right? People were all excited about the end of lockdowns by the summer, and then suddenly, COVID became this very small thing that we don't care about much anymore, and we have something called war. That's why without knowledge and ibadah, listen to this, without knowledge, seeking knowledge as Muslims, we have to learn our deen on a regular basis. Learn the Quran, tafsir, sirah, sunnah, fiqh, so on and so forth, aqidah. We need this on a regular basis, without knowledge, reminders, and without ibadah, right? Prayer, reciting the Quran, making dhikr, and so on and so forth these events can be extremely exhausting if you don't have that they can destroy you mentally they can change you for the worst right you can lose your deen without even realize it subhanallah again just think about this just think about this we went from covid to world war three potential within a few hours just like out of nowhere it was not like you know people we just want to let you know there's a big of chance in a few uh, months there's going to be a uh, you know a war between russia and ukraine and both sides are getting ready just like out of nowhere that's why here let me quote the hadith of prophet muhammad sallallahu in the sahih the highly authentic hadith he says, Ali making ibadah during harj, again, harj is killing and fitan and, and uh, tests and confusion and so on. He says, Ali 
it's like making hijrah to Prophet Muhammad meaning it, it will save your deen inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also going back to COVID here one of the things that I wanted to uh, to, uh, to 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 share again to reshare in the series of videos I was planning to make about the COVID by the way we are getting to war we're going to talk about war in a moment inshallah this is a very important introduction you will see why in a moment inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala when COVID first started, I remember that in March 2020, I made it, I said in khutbah, and I also said it in a lecture, and I have them recorded until today. I said that this whole COVID thing is very likely to last for two, three years, okay? Two to three years. And I said that if it lasts that long, it will end or it will mark the end of the liberal world as we know it nowadays in the west and that the west will start becoming more and more conservative religious people will start going back to the church and we are already seeing the signs nowadays i said if it lasts two to three years now you have the this war if it goes full scale again definitely this is going to be the case right you will see that the west the face of the west completely changed it will go back to becoming you know the christian uh basically christian nations people go back to the church the church will become very present in everyday life in politics and so on and so forth and i'm just giving you here again brief summary of these different points another point here uh allah Azzawajal says in the quran al karim when he talks about the ayat the warnings and the adab he sent down on the people of fir'aun so fir'aun was facing prophet musa moses السلام, peace be upon him okay and because fir'aun was being such an enemy to allah and to rasulullah musa moses السلام, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was sending him warnings before the big destruction happens and those warnings, what's interesting in the Quran is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا نُرِيهِمْ مِنْ آيَةٍ إِلَّا هِيَ أَكْبَرُ مِنْ أُخْتِهَا وَأَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِالْعَذَابِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ The warnings were incremental. Every sign, every warning that will come, it was bigger than the one before it, right? So a sign. They don't get the point. Allah Azzawajal sends a bigger one, and then a bigger one, and then a bigger one, and then Allah Azzawajal he says also that he sent them the adab, the punishment. Maybe they will come back, they will make tawbah. But unfortunately, they did not listen. They listened to a shaitan. Nowadays, I strongly believe that COVID was a big warning. And I strongly believed, believed that during COVID that because people, they don't seem to get the point, they are not turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are not, you know questioning again their state and saying maybe you know maybe we, we went you know a bit too much on corruption and oppression and so on and so forth we should look at our state as human beings and you know repent go back to to uh, to common sense at least you know if it's not coming back to allah Azzawajal, at least you know like putting a break on the that you know um that uh oppression and corruption machine it did not happen because it did not happen i expected and i still expect something bigger to come after covid that covid was like a nothing it was like a small little little warning you know like someone doing this to a kid right it's like this first warning warning number one maybe the second warning is what we are seeing right now if this is going to turn into world war three well it's going to be some sort of a big adab may allah azawajal protect us if this is going to stop somehow inshallah in a few weeks in a few months well it will be a bigger sign and a bigger warning than covid that watch out we can lose everything we can lose all the luxury that we have very easily covid came to challenge our world view and our false sense of trust trusting science remember before we say oh we trust science we trust modernity and humanism we trust secular liberal values of governance wars well that's the thing of the past right people they believe in the west like that's why they, you see, you see they are they are shocked and scared nowadays they are frightened because they 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 they, they would not expect war to happen in europe they thought that war was part of the past 
or war only happens somewhere else in the Middle East and the poor countries, right? No, that's a false sense of trust and security again. And also, people, they believed, you know, just uh, two years ago, barely three years ago, people believed that, you know, epidemics, they were something that's part of the past and illnesses and, and you know, quarantine, that's part of the past. We hear about Ebola in Africa, and so that's somewhere else, poor countries. In the West, we are so powerful. We have science. We, we can predict everything. We can deal with everything. We have technology. Well, that was a false sense of trust. So that's why we have learned it the hard way that for one, governments worldwide, worldwide governments are not ready to face epidemics. And also that science does not have the quick answer to everything, including viruses like COVID. We saw the confusion, the mess in how the virus and how the COVID situation was being managed. Everybody saw the, the mess, the confusion. So what do you want me to tell you after this, more than this? So you think, let me, please answer me. I know this is frightening to some people, but just think about it, okay? Do you think those same leaders that were unable to properly manage a COVID situation that was not the end of the world, it was not like as bad as we thought, it would become. There was reasons in the beginning to, to think, you know, that this might be a big plague or something like this. Do you think those leaders, do you think that they are fit to manage conflicts, global conflicts, in a rational and wise way? Do you think they are fit to de-escalate, to find a solution for this? I personally don't believe so. I don't believe so. I mean, Many of them. Let's just look at the situation here. Let's be let's be uh, practical. Let's be realistic. Many of the political leaders we have nowadays around the world it hasn't been long, right? Like the like a lot of them were elected like four years ago, right before right before COVID, four years, three years ago, five years ago. Many of them were elected to build bike paths. To make the world green, right? So again, four years ago, typical election in many Western countries was what? I'm going to, if you elect me, I'm going to build more bike paths. I'm going to make the world greener. I'm going to take action for the environment. While other human beings were suffering of war elsewhere in the world, but they kept talking about this thing called, for example, climate change. Why? They said, well, it's for the good of mankind, it's for the future of this earth, when in reality, now we realize, we can see it, a plague or a mad person pushing the button that triggers the nukes can destroy half of the world in a few days, within a few days, right? So think about, like, compare here, bike lanes, bike paths, environment, uh, banning uh, plastic bags. They were elected to do this. Look what they are facing. Were they psychologically ready for this, right? Did they study this? Did they get elected to, to, to manage a war situation, to, to deal with this? They were not. That's why I personally don't have much trust in the decisions that they will be making in the near future. All we can say is may Allah Azza wa Jal protect us subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, this is taking the ni'mah for granted. Having this false sense of security, which makes you become very greedy and very selfish. Science also, we have um, come to the conclusion, we have seen it again, some people maybe they are still blind, they don't want to see it, but science does not, ha does not have a solution for everything. It did not have a perfect solution for the COVID situation. And for sure, definitely, listen to this, science does not have a solution for greed because people, they say, oh, science has killed religion. We don't need religion anymore. We don't need morals anymore. We have science, we have technology, we have... Uh, the economy, we have the market, just be successful, make millions of dollars, be a content creator online. So the, the, the reality is science does not have a solution for greed, for ego, for hatred, for oppression, which are the main triggers of war. It's actually serving 
war science is serving war and empowered empowering war science nowadays through technology is empowering ego because you know the russian leader or the american leader or any other leader why do they feel so powerful why do they feel so so greedy why do they have so much ego why do they feel that you know they can have it their own way is it again because of some physical strength and they are so brave people no it's because of science and technology they have a lot of gadgets right under their hands they have tanks and fighter jets and nuclear weapons and so on and so forth now we move to the question or to the portion that i i'm sure everybody wants me to talk about this that's where that's what everyone wants to hear what is the position of the muslim um, of the Muslims, of you as a Muslim, of me as, as Muslims, what should be our position concerning what is happening right now, the current war between Russia and Ukraine? First of all, let's remind ourselves how they have lowered the value of the blood of the Muslims, thinking that it won't turn against them one day. In reality, what they did when they went and killed so many Muslims in the past decades elsewhere in the world, in reality, what they have produced, what they did exactly, <clears throat> is that they have lowered not only the value of the blood of the Muslims, they lowered the value of human life altogether. The world has become desensitized to killing and violence. The world in which we live nowadays, it has become desensitized to killing and to violence. People, they watch movies, they play video games. Look at the children nowadays, video games that they play, right? If I played video games like that when I was young, my parents would think that I was crazy. But look at the video games that they have nowadays. It's just about killing and massacring. And, you know, I check some of the, if you check some of the social media, go, for example, on some social media, I, I don't advise you to, to waste your time on it if you don't have it. But I'm just telling you, you know, this is what the situation is. Some social media that target, you know, the newer generation, uh, like TikTok, for example, it's subhanAllah, it's just insane how you have a lot of videos about, you know, a video that shows someone basically, you know, having an accident, a dangerous accident or someone dying or someone being killed. And people in the comments, you know, m m most people, they, they take this as, as, as a funny situation, as a joke, right? They just, they, they, there, there is no, there is no value to human life anymore. People, they are ready for everything they can become killers tomorrow if they have to if they are pushed to do so subhanahu wa ta'ala and you can see the contrast here between the world in which we live the culture put religion aside again just i'm talking here about uh what this what the uh what the state the mental state of people is you can contrast the culture nowadays the killing culture the massacring culture in which we live nowadays, you can contrast that with the post-World War II world where people, they had a lot of, you know, that's why you had a lot of uh, make uh, make peace movements, pro-peace people, they were, they were uh, being activists for peace, right? The leftists, for example, they were activists, you know, just up to barely a decade or two decades ago. You had a lot of people in the West that were, uh, that were, active being active politically active to say that we should make peace don't make wars <laughs> now that same movement they put peace aside and they're talking about environment and being green and because why because now you have a new generation that does not know what the damages of war can be they don't know it right people after world war ii they went through war they suffered a lot they did not want to go back to that nightmare anymore. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Al-Quran Al-Kareem, لَهُ مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسًا بِغَيْرِ نَفْسٍ أَوْ فَسَادٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَكَأَنَّمَا قَتَلَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا The one that kills one person, one soul, unjustly, it is as if he has killed all of mankind. عِيَادًا بِاللَّهِ You know, this ayah now, thinking about what they did to the Muslims, I understand it better. Because by killing some other people elsewhere in the world, it is as if they have they have killed all of mankind. Because they are they, they have opened the gate to 
uh, when people saw what happened in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Palestine, this has opened the door, you know, to, okay, so what, what what's wrong with making war? Everybody can make war. Everybody can make massacres, right? It's not a big deal anymore. Iyadun Billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think uh, of the situation, you know, what would the situation be nowadays if they did not invade Afghanistan and Iraq? When they have, when in, they invaded Afghanistan and Iraq, they were saying basically we have the right to invade any country we want. Now the Russians, they are doing the same thing. They say if you have the right to invade any country, well, so do we because you know, uh, basically word is word is to the uh, word is to power. Whoever has the power has the strength. They they can do it. It's like the law of the jungle. Who who cares about the truth and justice? It's just about if you have the ability to do it, you have the guts to do it. Just go ahead and do it. And when they came out, when the West came out of Afghanistan, we we uh, we we heard the message. Everybody saw the message, right? The Russian leadership they got the message. They got a sense of the message of the state of of mind of the Western world and the Americans because the message was very clear. We are not into wars anymore for the moment. We need to sort out our own things at home. So when the Russian leadership they got the message. Well, they uh, became convinced that, you know, if we go and invade Ukraine, uh, the Americans are not going to do much, which is what we see nowadays, right? We see it nowadays. Again, it doesn't mean that this is not going to escalate, but this is going to maybe take time. Allah Ta'ala A'lam. Uh, this reminds me of the very famous Obama's red line. Remember in 2012, so exactly 10 years ago, the American president, Obama, he said in a very famous statement, he said that, you know, Assad is killing his own people in Syria. This is not good. But we're not doing anything about it. However, there's a red line. The red line is the chemical weapons. If he uses chemi chemical weapons against his own people, this is going to be a red line. We're not going to tolerate this. Well, Assad, he actually went and killed his own people with chemical weapons. And Obama did not do anything. I believe that that was the first message that was sent to the Russians, that the Americans, they're not going to face us anymore, right? That we can do whatever we want. And then the second message was, you know, the way how they came out of Afghanistan. So they said it that as a society, we don't want to be, uh, we don't want, we don't want to do war. So even if the West is going to end up, you know, facing Russia, Allahu A'lam, in the next few weeks, we don't know what's going to happen. But if that ends up happening, it's going to be out of, um, you know, out of ikrah, right? Like they, they have to do it. They don't want to do it, but they have to do it. So wouldn't the world be much better if, those countries in the Middle East were just left alone from the very beginning. Inna fi ayah, for those who reflect, of course. Which leads me again to the famous question, should we pick a side in this current war? On one side, on one hand, you have those claimed to be Muslims who are puppets of RT watching Russia today, propaganda day and night, reading Russian propaganda, and conspiracy theories and so on and so forth and they have developed this love for Adullah, the enemy of Allah who is Putin, this Russian leader. This man has massacred, if you truly are a Muslim, if you are not a Munafiq, if you truly are a Muslim, he has massacred your own brothers and sisters in Islam. Only a Munafiq, Iyadha Billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala, only a Munafiq would love the enemy of Allah, like this, this shaitan, this criminal who has killed so many Muslims in Syria and elsewhere, Iyadun Billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's an ayah in the Quran Kareem in which Allah Azza wa Jalla, he says, لا تجد قوم يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر يوادون من حاد الله ورسوله ولو كانوا آباءهم أو أبناءهم أو إخوانهم أو عشيرتهم الآية. Allah Azza wa Jalla says that there is no one that is a true believer in Allah and the hereafter, that takes as allies the enemies of Allah Azza wa Jal. This can never happen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear. He said, even if that enemy of Allah is your father, your brother, your son, your ashira. So think about this. <clears throat> if Putin was your own father, 
you cannot, as a believer, love him, take him as an ally, be on his side. You know, this is impossible. This is nifaq. You are a munafiq. You are not a true believer in Allah and the hereafter. Um, some people, uh, they are asking about Qadirov or Al-Qadir of this uh, man from Chechnya that is being used. Again, he's a puppet of uh, Putin of the Russian leader, Iyadun Billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this man is again a criminal. He is a thug. He is an enemy of Allah Azza wa Jal. Don't be fooled. Someone is not a Muslim just because they have a beard and they say, Takbir Allahu Akbar. This does not make you Muslim by itself. Okay, let's let, let, let us make this very, very clear. So I don't want anyone to, to say, and you know, scholars of Islam, because it's important here for the image of Islam again, the image of the Muslims, we don't want to be dry into this conflict right the scholars that are ulama already they have dissociated islam and dissociated the muslims from this man qadirov okay so this qadirov is only the uh, the puppet and the servant and the slave of the russian leader he is not acting in accordance to islam or in the name of islam because even in chechnya this man is a uh, is a taghiya, he's a corrupt leader that has killed his own people, Iyadun Billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is not someone who is, you know, loved by the Muslims, our brothers and sisters in Chechnya and so on and so forth. Now, on the other hand, okay, we have also, we are seeing nowadays, Muslim groups forming in Ukraine to fight the Russians. I understand in this case, I'm not getting into the fiqh yet, but I understand here just from a, an emotional perspective, I understand at least they are on the defensive stance, okay? So there's already a difference here between this Qadirov on one side who is on the offensive side, you're, you're going to someone else's land, and you have these uh, Muslims in Ukraine forming these groups. They say it's to, to defend our land, right? To 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 face the uh, the invasion. Okay, I understand this is a defensive stance. At least I'm not I'm not making a statement here. I'm not taking position. I'm just saying I understand it. It makes more sense, right? However, look at this. Imagine this. This situation right now would be basically two groups who would fight each other right, in Ukraine, and then the ones coming from Chechnya, both claiming to be guided by Islam, when they are just puppets and tools being used. So again, don't be fooled. Let's get into the fiqh right now. Let's talk about the rulings, what Islam says about this. First of all, in Islam, we have a principle, taking lives of others, or risking your own life, which is what people, they do in war, right? When you go to war, you are risking your own life that it you might be killed and also you are willing to kill others in islam doing war for these two points here only fi because human life is extremely valued in islam allah azza wa jal has given life subhanahu wa ta'ala lidhi khalaq al mawta wal hayata he has created life it's not up to anyone to just decide I'm going to war to kill other people or I'm going to war to be killed. We don't have the right to do it without, you know, a clear evidence that this is fi sabirillah, the one who gave life, which who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has given us the right to do it, right? So that's why Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when they asked him, who is fi sabirillah, ya Rasulullah? Who is fighting? Who is doing war fi sabirillah? He said, Man litakuna kalimatullahi fahuwa fi sabirillah. It is only the one who fights to make the word of Allah Azza wa Jal, the word of truth, the highest. That's the one fi sabirillah. And of course, what we also have in the hadith that, uh, you know, it uh, also includes fi sabirillah when someone is defending his own life, his property, his family. That's part of also fi sabirillah. But Otherwise, every other fighting is fi sabili shaytan, fi sabili jahiliya. And whoever fights fi sabili shaytan is going to go to jahannam. Iyadhan billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, no Quran, no ayah in the Quran, no hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, no ruling, statement, position in the famous four madhahib of fiqh jurisprudence 
not even the Zahiri ones. Nowhere can you find a justification for Muslims getting actively involved in this war. Let this be very clear, which reminds me here of the fatwa that I give as an example, very famous fatwa of Imam Malik ta'ala, when he was asked about Al-Bughat. Who are Al-Bughat? Al-Bughat are uh, people that basically make uh, a revolution. They just revolt against the ruler, against the Muslim ruler. There's a Muslim ruler, a proper one, like in the time of Imam Malik, like a Khalifa. And then there's a group of people, they just, you know, they they, they want basically to make a, a coup d'etat. They want to to uh, to take him out of his position. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, he said, because by default in Islam, we have to defend our ruler. Of course, in that situation, we can't allow for just any group to come out and, you know, to destabilize the situation. However, Imam Malik, he said, if that ruler, the Muslim ruler, the Khalifa, if he is unjust and oppressor, zalim, he said, stay away from this fight. Don't get involved. It's an oppressor against an oppressor. Wrong against wrong. Let them fight each other. Don't get involved in this. That's a very famous fatwa of Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala. The only exception I would imagine in this situation, only exception, is for Muslims in Ukraine who feel directly threatened and uh, that they are not able to stay safe while being neutral. Okay, so again, the situation here would be if there are groups of Muslims in Ukraine, I'm not answering them. Okay, it's up to them to ask the scholars, the ulama. I'm not making fatwa about this because they have to talk, first of all, to true ulama, big ulama of the ummah. This is a big topic, a big a matter, first of all. And second of all, they have to clarify, describe more in detail the situation. But I'm just giving you the theory here. If there's a group of Muslims in Ukraine who are uh, who feel threatened, for example, by the invasion of the Russians, directly threatened, and they feel that, you know, if they just stay neutral, the Russians, you know, will come and hurt them and kill them and so on and so forth. This is a situation that has, you know, a justification according to the traditional fiqh of the ulama, alayhim rahmatullahi ta'ala. And even here, you know, the concept, the scholars, they talk about the concept of arraya. What is arraya? Even in this situation, arraya means the leadership. That the Muslims basically they should be independent, they should just defend themselves as a separate entity, right? Not be under the leadership serving for some serving something else. But again, the details if someone you know lives in Ukraine, they they listen to this, they have a question, ask their ulama, ask the people of, of knowledge. I'm not making a fatwa about such a such a big thing, such a major thing, because this is up to the ulama, people of al ishtihad. Now some people they bring another point which is they say uh we support the oppressed we support the innocent people that's part of our religion that we have to support the oppressed and the innocent people right yeah sure no problem however what do you mean exactly but by, by the support that you are willing to offer that you want to offer are you talking about having feelings and being sad and compassionate toward children and innocent people who are going to suffer either in Ukraine or maybe elsewhere also, right? Maybe even in Russia. Maybe the, the, the war is going to happen on the Russian lands as well. There's going to be Russian kids being killed and so on and so forth. So if someone is talking about having feelings, right? Being sad for all those innocent people, no one will blame you for this. As long as, of course, you don't forget uh, that your own ummah is suffering as well. That's very important. Another question that some people, they ask is, what about making dua? Making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you make dua for those people? Let me ask you one thing. How often do you make dua for your own ummah, for the sufferings of your own ummah? Uh, that's the first question. If someone is making dua for Palestine and Syria and, uh, and Burma all the time, we can kind of understand this. But if you have no feelings for your own ummah, you don't make dua for your own ummah, think about this situation. I'm going to give a situation that, you know, it's a bit... It's a bit um, it's a bit graphic here, as they say. Not too much, but I'm just saying. Some people, they don't like these type of examples, but let me just give the, ex the example because it's important, right? We are talking about war nowadays. Imagine if your own child had a very serious accident, like a big accident, and he is at the moment in the emergency room. Think about this situation. 
You go to the emergency room, right? Your, your child is right there, is inside this room. You know it. And, he, you know, his life is threatened by the accident, by what just has just happened. How much compassion, please tell me honestly, for the people telling me we have to make dua and we have to... How much can, compassion do you have left for everyone else suffering in the hospital? Of course, you will be blinded by your situation. Your heart will be completely consumed by your own tragedy. You will forget that there are other people suffering. You, you, you will forget everybody else, right? You will just be focusing on this room, this bed. This is my own child. This is our nature as human beings. We don't have unlimited emotional resources that we can distribute to the whole world. We have one heart and if you're busy with one thing, you will forget the rest, right? So if someone is busy with oh, making so much dua for Ukraine and Russia, people suffering, well, you will forget your own brothers and sisters in Islam. So please pick your priorities. Let me tell you and answer also a warning here. Nasiha, uh, you will eventually see this in the next few weeks again if this drags on for a long time, if this conflict goes on for a long time. If you see that your imam or some imam at the masjid makes dua, you know, let's make dua for Ukraine, may Allah Azza wa Jal, or subhanahu wa ta'ala. One thing here, if that imam is not used to making dua usually for Palestine and for Kashmir and for and for, then you should know that this is not a sincere dua that he is making. This is riya instead of dua. This is a political dua. He's just trying to look good, basically, to give a good impression. He's not talking to Allah, he's talking to whoever is looking at him, right? And that's why this is not ibadah. And this dua won't go beyond the ceiling of the masjid, Iyadan Billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is, you know, this is very, uh, this is very disgusting when, when the ibadah gets, becomes politics, right? The ibadah becomes politics. You give dua to some people, but you don't give to those people. You give dua if, if it's appreciated by the media, by the society, but you don't give it when when they don't like it, and so on and so forth. This is highly disgusting. Of course, here I'm not talking about someone making dua for the Muslims, for example, minorities in Ukraine and Russia and elsewhere. Of course, Now, the worst of this is, I'm getting here to the hot topic, uh, some people, they actually mean that we should actively be part of this, okay? So we had those who want to support with their feelings, then we have those who want to support with their dua, then the next thing we have, some people that actually want to be actively part of this. And some people, they want to go to Ukraine, some Muslims. I'm talking about Muslims here, of course. Some Muslims, they want to go to Ukraine to become foreign fighters, right? They say, we have to stand up for the truth, ya akhi. It's the deen of Allah. Are you crazy? Like, seriously, are you crazy, ya akhi? Tell me, what can you do for them exactly? How can you help them, right? Are you more powerful than their own NATO allies these people who do they have as an ally they have nato right that the, the strongest the, the most powerful super, human superpower today on earth what can you offer more what can you yeah miskin offer of, offer more knowing that there is nothing you have done for your own ummah what did you do for your sisters being uh being oppressed and being attacked on the streets in India, for example, and we saw so many videos. What did you do for the Muslims in China, in Burma, and elsewhere? You probably did nothing, and there's not much you can do. So please answer me, how can you go and face Russia in Ukraine as a Muslim? Syria, Palestine, do you hear about those? Up to today in Syria, until today. You don't see this in the news, but until today airstrikes are happening on a weekly basis but they decided to hide this right to put this away from the media to put this in a closet they don't talk about this anymore why because i i remember this has you know started about five to six years ago before they used to talk a lot about syria people dying in syria and airstrikes and civilians and then at a certain point you do some suddenly has all stopped that was about five or six years ago. They said because, you know, these images and these information, these news, they are too graphic. 
and we don't want to hurt your feelings. Some social media like YouTube and so on and so forth, they took off suddenly. They removed tons of uh, archives. Those are important archives for history that look what this Assad, look what Putin has done to the Muslims, to the children, to the innocent civilians. No, they took them away. They said, this is too graphic content. So we'd rather you, uh, we, we, we would rather have you uh, keep yourselves busy with cool content creator videos of food reviews and shoes reviews while other innocent children they are literally getting grilled elsewhere in this world but please don't watch because it's too graphic well the bad news unfortunately we hope it's not going to be the case inshallah but the bad news is the world the whole world is maybe about to become graphic content in real life, not over the internet. So there is an attempt right now. You can see this. I already saw some elements, but this is going to increase with the time. This is going to increase with the time. There is this attempt to drag the Muslims into this conflict. You will see. You will see. This will increase with the time. That's why you know I want to give you nasiha right now because maybe in in some uh, in a few weeks in a few months we will not be able to talk about this anymore. Right? Just think about again. Think about COVID. After a certain point, you you, you can't talk anymore. You don't have the freedom to express yourselves anymore. So this is the time to give the nasiha right before the fitna becomes out of control because right now muslims alhamdulillah they, they still can reflect and think and and ask questions there's an attempt right now to drag muslims into this as it was the case in world war world war one and world war two to end up with the situations where you will have muslims killing muslims fi sabili shaytan going to jahannam Hadith of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in the authentic hadith, hadith of Abu Bakrata radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, إِذَا الْتَقَى الْمُسْلِمَانِ بِسَيْفَيْهِمَا فَالْقَاتِلُ وَالْمَقْتُولُ فِي النَّارِ قَالُوا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ هَذَا الْقَاتِلُ فَمَا بَالُ الْمَقْتُولُ قَالَ إِنَّهُ كَانَ حَرِيصًا عَلَى قَتْلِ صَاحِبِهِ So he said, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that when two Muslims, they face each other with their swords, they are fighting each other, they want to kill each other. He said, وسلم, the killer and the one getting killed, both of them will go to Jahannam, will go to hellfire. They said, Ya Rasulullah, <coughs> well, one is the one is the killer. We understand he's going to end up in Jahannam. What about the other one? He's poor him, he's the victim. Prophet Muhammad he said, because he was also interested and determined to kill his brother. So both sides are going to be fi sabili as shaitan. And let's make this very clear before people lose their common sense. Because again, remember, in Fitan people, they lose their common sense. They just become so polarized and so convinced and so consumed by the situation. They will completely forget. And I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you, <laughs> you know, again, if this lasts for a long time, Allahu A'lam, if this stops, you know, next week, in two weeks, they are going to make some peace deal or something, alhamdulillah. But if this is going to drag, if this is going to last for many months, and get bigger and bigger trust me you will start hearing around the world including in the west <laughs> you will have you know people making khutbah like this on the minbar telling you about the importance of jihad fi sabirillah jihad is a great deed and muslims should go make jihad you know against the russians and on the other side also in russia you will have you know people and uh Preachers who will say that we have to make jihad against the opponent and we have to support our government and our land. This is called the deen, the haq, the truth, being used as a tool. Kalimatu haqqin yuradu biha batil. So just keep this in mind right now, okay? So that you, you won't be confused after and I said, oh, the shaykh, he said this in the Jumu'ah. I'm telling you right now, I saw a video yesterday of, uh, of this news, right? I'm sure this is fake news, but this is propaganda. I, I don't know who's behind this video. It was in Arabic, but this this basically story they are claiming that in the Ukrainian in the Ukrainian Air Force, there is this one Muslim pilot who is unknown. He is anonymous. He do, they don't want to say his name for security reasons, but he is Muslim. And he's a hero. He has brought down so many Russian aircrafts and so many Russian deaths, right? They say he's a national hero and he's a Muslim, but we can't say his name. 
Okay, so subhanAllah, this is again, you see the attempt here to drag the Muslims, right, to get you emotionally attached to, whoa, mashallah, we're so proud of you, brother, alhamdulillah, when in reality, this man, maybe he he, he never actually existed. Um, once Muslims, just think about this, once Muslims, if this happened, may Allah Azza protect us, Allah al -afiyah. once Muslim populations and masses will start picking sides in this war and actively cheering for war and confrontation, their local governments will feel comfortable getting involved as well. Right now, there's no government in the Muslim countries, I guarantee to you. There's no government that's just going to say, we are joining this war. Even if there's pressure from outside, they, they won't dare to do this, okay? Because, but if they realize that the population, a big portion of the population is already, you know, cheering for it, we are with this side or we are with the other side, they will end up getting involved in this war. What is the consequence? Some people, they still don't see the, you know, how, how far would this go? Just think about this, okay? Pakistan, for example, going pro-Russia, especially if China gets involved. Pakistan going pro-Russia. And the Gulf countries like Saudi going pro-NATO. And Egypt going. And this is going to be a large-scale massacre within the ummah muslims will be fi fighting each other right fighting each other subhanahu wa ta'ala so is that what you want by picking your side and cheering for a confrontation you want to divide us more you want more bloodshed uh, did you think about the possibility one day of a ballistic missile landing in Cairo and another one landing in Karachi is that what you want to get to that's why prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said man kana the one who believes in allah and hereafter he should either say good or remain silent when you don't know what the consequences what the uh, the weight of your words is be silent Besides, nobody's forcing you to have to make a statement okay you're not the spokesperson of the ummah you're not the khalifa you're not the leader of the united nations nobody is expecting a statement from you if you have knowledge wisdom qualifications expertise you know what you're talking about go ahead but if not just remain silent your words can be very dangerous and maybe you don't realize it because some people they say everyone says you know but you know it's just my opinion i'm just one person right but everybody's a one person in the end but guess what because everybody's a one person in the end there is a chance somewhere that some one person maybe it's you maybe it's me one that one one person one individual that doesn't have much influence you just said to someone to one of your friends or you wrote over the internet we should side with russia or you said Oh, we should side with Ukraine. It's our duty in Islam. And someone was influenced by you and, you know, spread the message as well. And at a certain point, it is going to get to someone who is influential. Someone who might become, or maybe he is, a prime minister in some Muslim country. Someone who is a, an influential journalist, influential politician, who is going to actually become convinced that as Muslims we have the duty to side with Russia or without Ukraine and he's going to start pushing for this and he has a lot of influence and because of that word that's why they say the beginning of the war Bidayatul Harbi Kalima war always starts with a word with a statement doesn't start with confrontation right away somebody looked at the other person let's make war Usually it's like it's escalating, right? Someone influence, influencing other people and so on and so forth. We have to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nattaqi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi hadihi, fi hadihi al ummah. And subhanAllah, it's interesting. I was thinking about this today. How sometimes, you know, when some people, this ha this happens, you know, all, all the time. You have sometimes two brothers that have an argument inside the masjid, okay? Two Muslim brothers, they have an argument about something, something not import important, doesn't matter. And you will see that a lot of Muslims, their position will be what? This is a fitna, they're fighting in the masjid. I'm leaving the masjid. I'm not praying in this masjid anymore. When in reality, this is not a fitna, okay? You're just, you're just exaggerating. We don't call this a fitna. Your duty in this situation is to go and to reconciliate. It's okay, brother, or someone is wrong. You tell him, look, look, akhi, you are wrong. He is right, right? You, just, you should just accept it. 
we should be actively doing islah between the muslimin but we have this culture nowadays of whenever two people they disagree in the masjid there's a small argument this is a fitna i'm leaving this place now when there is a potential of world war 3 in a world war 3 possible situation the very same people are so quick to share their thoughts and conclusions with no knowledge to share information without verifying Beware of fake news because information warfare is a very big part of conflicts nowadays in, in the world in which we live. Okay, Not everything you hear in the news from either side, not everything you hear in the news and you know uh, what you read all over the internet, not everything is, is pure truth. That's why I ask you before you made your conclusion to side with uh, the left or with the right, with the east or with the west, I ask you a question. Do you know the full story? There's always something more to the story in these type of conflicts, okay? There's always something more to the story than what, than what we are being told. Yes, we understand people are dying, civilians, people are suffering. This is horrible. However, what, the story behind it, what has led to this? There's always usually something more to the story. And I'm not among the people. I'm not one of the, those people that say, you know, just don't be interested. You will never find the truth. No, I believe that even in conflicts and confusion and so on and so forth, with research and, and uh, you know, asking, taking your time, inshallah, you can, you can be guided to the truth. Yes, there's more to the story. But if you do your research, in a lot of cases, you can find who is right and who is wrong. The question is, one very important point here. Do you know the culture? Do you know the language? That's an, a rule that I always abide by, always go by this rule. If something relates to a place elsewhere in the, in, in the world, and that I don't have trustworthy sources, trustworthy Muslims that can tell me exactly what is happening, you know, from both sides, then the next move is what I ask myself. Do I know the culture? Do I understand the language? If yes, then if it's very important for me, I can do my own research, right? If you ask me what happens in, uh, about something that happens in Egypt, right? Especially nowadays with the internet, I can find the truth, inshallah. If I have to, I can find, I can investigate because I know the Arab culture. I understand the language itself. I know the, the background behind it. Russia, Ukraine, how many Muslims around the world, how many Muslims viewing, watching this video know about Russian history, Ukrainian history, uh, Russian culture, Ukrainian culture, the language, are you able to read by yourselves or you watch videos and stuff online and you just read a translation, somebody's telling you that this is what they are saying, very important here. Also, there's another reason, a very good reason here, why Muslims should stay neutral and stay completely out of this which doesn't mean by the way that you should be uninterested of course you have to be interested we have to follow what's going on because this is going to have an impact on us big or small impact allahu alam but by saying be neutral meaning you're not picking sides we have to remain neutral why this is for the good of mankind i will tell you why because if muslims pick sides this will add fuel to the fire remember people we are hundreds of of millions of individuals around the world. Muslims are not 1,000 people, my, minority people somewhere, right? We are hundreds of millions of people. If all of these hundred or many of these hundreds of millions of people get involved in the war, well, that's a lot of fuel being added to the fire until we can hopefully become one day, inshallah, sometime soon, the solution to these type of conflicts once this ummah will become strong and united again. But right now, let me give you this example and please keep it in your mind whenever someone, you know, tries to drag you into this fitna, adding Muslims to this situation including dragging the Muslims into it, is like a man who is carrying 20 liters of gasoline. Okay, he has 20 liters of gasoline. He's going to his house or to his factory for a reason for another. And then he sees someone outside playing with fire. He's playing with fire. He's, 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 uh, he, he lit a fire and he's playing with it. And the fire is going bigger. He says, what are you doing? Come here. And he runs toward him, right? Is this a safe thing? Is this a wise decision to go and get involved uh, in trying to turn off that fire when you have in your hands 20 liters of gasoline? This is a crazy, foolish move. This is exactly the same thing, right? 
Muslims, hundreds of millions of people around the world. If they stay neutral, this is going to limit, inshallah ta'ala, the danger, the threat, how big this thing can become. Wallahu ta'ala, wallahu ta'ala a'la, wa a'lam subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, by the way, some people, I see that some people, they are already quoting the ayah from the Quran and the very famous story from the from the seerah when Allah Azza wa Jal says غُلِبَتِ الرُّومِ فِي أَدْنَا الْأَرْضِ وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ In Surah Al-Rum, go back to Surah Al-Rum, this ayah is talking about the Rom when the Romans and the Persians, they had a big a battle, big clash in the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What was the position of the Muslims? As we all know, the Muslims, their hearts were with the Romans because the Romans, they were Christians. So they were closer to the truth than the Persians who at the time they were mushrikeen. Okay, they were polytheists. So some people, they say, see, like Muslims, they sided with, with the Romans. La akhil habib. This does not make sense at all. First of all, at that time, both sides did not do any harm to the Muslims, okay? Both sides did not do any harm to the Muslims. Muslims, they had no contact yet with the Romans or the Persians. So that's why they just had feelings. They were away from the situation. Prophet Muhammad did not take the Sahaba and say, let's go fight with the Romans. This is for our good, for our future. And also, conflicts back in the day that conflict, that clash between the Romans and the Persians, very different from the type of conflicts we have nowadays, okay? Again, back in the days, Christ, uh, sorry, the Romans, the Christians facing the polytheists, the Persians, these are two big armies on an, in an open land having a big battle. Nowadays, it's not the same thing. Nowadays, war can can mean, you know, as I said, missiles landing randomly in Africa, Asia, Europe, anywhere Allah Ta'ala Allah Ta'ala A'lam same thing also I'm not going to expand much on this because you know I don't want to, to to keep you for three hours here hopefully we can be done pretty soon inshallah um, same thing some people uh, they quote this very famous hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he said Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu talked about a time one of the signs of the end of times it will come in the future where the Muslims they will make peace with the Romans meaning with the West what we call nowadays the West okay this hadith nothing there's nothing that proves that this situation is talking about this hadith please don't just like quote a hadith left and right okay no, this hadith did not state uh, in 2022 the Muslims are going to side with the Ukrainians and there's going to be NATO. Prophet Sassim did not say this. He talked about something that will happen in the future. Maybe this time, maybe in 10 years, maybe in, in, in one century. Allahu A'lam. We don't know and uh, it is only Allah Azza wa Jal who knows. Please don't just play with a hadith and ayat like this trying to quote them out of context and you know trying to force your own interpretation you just made up in your own mind because you just want to justify your position. Listen to this carefully. And this is just uh, another example. One, ex I can give you lots of examples. I'm just trying to give a lot of reasons here because I know the fitna is going to get, the more this, going to, this is going to last, the bigger the fitna is going to be. So I want you to be equipped, okay, uh, from a ilm perspective, from a fiqh, and also from a rational perspective, from a logical perspective, to be, to be ready, to be equipped, to answer, to, to think further than what you are told. Listen to this example. There is this group called Azov. Azov is a neo-Nazi special operation unit in the Ukrainian forces, okay? This is inside the Ukrainian National Guard. This is their, uh, this is basically their official army, right? It's, it's part of the official forces of Ukraine. And this is a neo-Nazi group that hates the Muslims. And there was this video two days ago or three days ago where some members of this neo-Nazi group, they were basically greasing their bullets and saying that this is for the Muslims. They were Referring to the uh, people of Qadirov, okay, that guy from Chechnya coming and bringing, he claims to be a Muslim, that's Zindiq Adullah. Of course, we understand that they, they take him as an enemy, he's coming to invade their lands. But just think about, just, uh, just reflect about how this has already escalated into something to do with religion, right? We're going to target Muslims, we're preparing bullets for Muslims. So tell me now, how do you think 
How do you suggest for those people telling you, you know, Muslims should be actively part of this? How are Muslims going to be fighting along these people on the same side as people who hate Islam? They want to, uh, they have fun killing Muslims, right? And this is even before the war. This is a neo Nazi. You can look, you can look for it online. You can find a lot of information and their history and so on and so forth. Uh, one thing that we can imagine, one scenario is we, we are going to, to, to it, that we can imagine is that this is going to lead somehow to another internal fight and conflicts. Okay, this the more it gets bigger, there's going to be also smaller wars inside, in fighting between different groups. So imagine there's the pro-Ukrainian side, but then because of some ideologies and so on and so forth, even on that one side, you're going to, to have what? Muslims fighting neo-Nazis inside and so on and so forth. So smaller scale uh, wars and battles and conflicts within a bigger conflict. This is disaster, right? And also remember, war is always a mess. War is always a mess. And the longer and bigger it gets, the more dirty it will be. There will be lots of corruption, evil, abuse, etc. We, we always know this. After war, there's always things coming up, right? It was not like as clean as it seemed that there was like good people and bad people. Even the good people, as they call them, they, you will see that, you know, they, they made a lot of abuse. It's just the nature of war. Once war is over, please think about this. Please think about this. I know a lot of people, they don't, they don't see, they, they don't look this far. Once this war will be over, they will want to clean the garbage, to clean the mess, the moral garbage for the sake of history. Because, you know, the winner in any war, after he wants to keep a clean image in history, he doesn't want to, to look like a bad person, right, in history. So he has to clean the garbage. He has to clean the narrative, the story itself to look good. So do you want them, honestly, do you want them if this becomes a global conflict? Do you want them in the future to say that things went wrong in this conflict because it was, because the war become is became islamicized you know this word islamicized they always say islamicizing of 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 the of the uh, of the west even in situations of peace and there are people who actually get convinced about the fact that you know uh, with the, the west is getting islamicized whereas islam has infiltrated the west and the politicians and governments this is in times of peace imagine in times of war do you want them one day to say that Muslims, they got involved in this. They will say this was a clean conflict between white Christians. You have Christians on both sides. But then Muslims, they got involved and they made it radical. They made it evil. Do you want them to say that one day? So it's not as black and white as it seems. The situation is highly volatile. And even in the West, ideologically and i will conclude with this inshallah and then i'll move to the last point inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala so even in the west ideologically societies are divided nowadays from an ideological perspective here i'm not talking about econ uh, like uh, the economy i'm talking about ideologically the societies in the west they have become very divided and highly unpredictable we saw this during covid remember during covid during covid People initially, right, before COVID, the Western society, typical Western society is we are all for freedom. You cannot take away the freedom of anyone for no reason, you know, unless he has committed a clear crime. Who cares? The government cannot touch anyone's freedom. And then suddenly COVID came and there was a lot of fear. So people, subhanAllah, suddenly the society is completely switched. They said, yeah, of course, take away our freedom. You know, freedom has to have a limit. You know, I'm ready to lose my freedom if it's for my well-being. I don't want to catch the virus. I don't want to die. I don't want my family, my father to die. So take away our freedom. Do curfew, do whatever you want. Restrict our, our uh, you know, our travel. You can do it. So subhanAllah, like a very, very sudden change of heart. 
And then again, another sudden change of heart after a year and a half or something. A lot of people, they start becoming fed up and saying, these are too much restrictions. What are you doing? This is overrated. This is exaggerated. So you see how societies, they change. They change very quickly. So those who like you today, who appreciate you standing with them today, tomorrow they are going to blame you and turn against you. Don't get yourself yourself involved again in this mess subhanahu wa ta'ala and as i said because societies in the west nowadays they are ideologically unpredictable and so polarized there's a possibility that this will lead to internal conflicts political conflicts even in the west in the western countries don't just assume that you know if nato goes against russia everybody will in uh, in the west will be all for nato let's go for this no this is this can develop into something else and i'll just take very briefly here as an example right-wing politics right right wing uh as as we call them sometimes the extreme right or something let's just call them right-wing politics extreme or not extreme that world in itself is already very complex okay so some people and some fractions and some groups and some thinkers some leaders in the right wing politics they are neo-nazis they are even against uh, Jews and against the Muslims and against. Some of them are just conservative Christian people. Some of them, they are pro-Putin and pro-Russia. And you probably heard that, you know, there's a lot of people in the West, you know, they, they are uh, influenced by websites like Infowars. We had the whole story of uh, the Trump election. They said that it was uh, that Trump had the support of Russia. We don't know. Allahu ta'ala alam. But still, it, it, it proves to you that, again, it's not black and white. Don't just assume people, they have already took their side and they will keep that side. No, people, they will change. And you might find yourself in some really odd situations and because of alliances you made uh, you made a few a few months before so what else did we want to talk about let me just conclude with one point inshallah ta'ala what i wanted to say here as a conclusion is as we have to know as muslims that inshallah ta'ala inshallah to conclude on a positive note inshallah ta'ala the future is for the ummah of prophet muhammad sallallahu this ummah is the future of this world this ummah is only this ummah is in a position to save the world if it was powerful enough to have a voice and to be taken seriously. That's the problem. Problem nowadays is that we are weak, we are not powerful enough, we are divided. That's why we are not taken seriously and we are unable to come up with a solution, to offer the solution. We have the solution. We have the solution as Muslims. In the Quran, in the Sunnah, we have the solution to the problems of mankind. But we are unable to share it. Why? Because we decided to adapt to the problem rather than sharing the solution that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. We decided, we preferred, unfortunately, to adapt to the problem rather than sharing the solution to the world. Who was a big threat after all? This is the question here that we have to ask everyone. You know, all those people that hate on Muslims day and night and they say that Islam is the cause of all evil in this world. Remember when they had that, that statement they used to always write on Twitter and so on and so forth. They say, oh, it's again the religion of peace. Basically, they were mocking Islam. Billah. So the question we ask nowadays is who was the big threat after all? Those who said that Islam is the threat to mankind and to, civil, and to civilization and modernity and to science and so on and so forth. Here is the example right in front of our eyes. Here is a purely European issue that threatens to destroy modern civilization and Islam has nothing to do with it. This is a purely European, uh, even to a certain extent, Christian, I understand not everyone's Christian nowadays, a lot of people they are atheists, but call it Christian, atheist, non-Muslim situation, problem that might escalate to the extent of destroying half of mankind, half of the civilization that we have. And it will destroy not only Europe, it will destroy Asia and Africa and America, right? Australia, it will spread destruction everywhere else if this gets out of control please tell me what does islam have to do with this what does islam they were saying that you know the world has reached such an ideal state but the only that's what they said they said the only 
cancer that remains is the religion of Islam. It's always Islam and the Muslims causing war and causing problem and so on and so forth. And they said, you know, we believe in science, but those people in the Middle East, they only believe in uh, in uh, man-made religion. That's how they mock Islam. So here's a perfect example of how science can actually destroy mankind. The scariest thing right now is not religion. Half of the problem right now, half of the problem is what? It is science. Because it is very difficult to put technology in the wrong, in, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the right hands, in the hands of people that we can trust, right? Nuclear weapons, tanks. Again, please remember this. Why is this war so frightening to people, to mankind? Why is it such a big threat? Not because people did, did, did not because we have individuals who want to fight, right? If people, they had just like, again, swords and uh, maybe some guns like back in the days, we can feel, alhamdulillah, safe. We can just stay away from that area and we will be good right but what is the big problem why is it so frightening nowadays because you have jets missiles nuclear weapons uh, cyber warfare technology science and it was given to the wrong people to people that we cannot trust them with the decisions right so when the russian leader any other leader when he makes a, a, a decision to invade the country to invade another country he has millions of soldiers and people who are going to obey him and and just like basically you know take those gadgets again and turned uh people's lives into into hell on earth as i said the future is for the ummah but at the same time don't be too optimistic because we need action in life to succeed things don't just happen by themselves you can just say dua ya allah allahumma ahlik al-zalimin bil zalimin and we are just like looking like this waiting for some miracle to happen it's not going to happen muslims have the obligation and this is the moment for it at least they have the obligation to unite especially muslim minorities like the muslims in the west for example because there might be very tough days ahead if you keep listening to the uh, smile it's sunnah type of speech ignoring the more serious uh basically things that we have to face as muslims then you know as they say good luck to you may allah azawajal protect you and also to those always looking for safety there's a lesson here to be derived and i will conclude very shortly inshallah there's a lesson to be derived for all those people who are always looking for afia what is afia uh you know i'm just looking for validation i just want to be accepted as a muslim i'm just sugar coating you know i'm not going to make any amr bil ma'roof nahi anil munkar i'm not going to stand up for the truth i'm not going to say the truth i'm not going to uh, to encourage good to stand up against the oppression being done to others and so on and so forth why because i just want my dunya to be safe i have a good job i have a good business i have a nice car i have a nice house i mean uh, i'm in good health alhamdulillah i have my family with me so i want to stay away from problems that's why a lot of people they that's how pe most people they think nowadays here's a lesson to all of us right you can stay as much as you can from the problems and ignore all the problems of the world look at the people of ukraine within just a few hours a few hours only few days less than a week you go from your beautiful house beautiful apartment beautiful car stable job good business to hiding in the subway losing everything becoming a refugee so that as Allah Azza wa Jal told us in the Quran Kareem, وَتَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَى The best provision is taqwa, fearing Allah, being upon the truth. It's not the money you have and the, the career that you're building and so on and so forth because everything can disappear, right? People of Ukraine, the normal people outside the street, they didn't do anything wrong. They didn't do anything wrong. They have nothing to do with this conflict. But things like this happen in life. And they will just drag you and throw you in a very bad position. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect us. And the final call here I want to make is a call to the true scholars of Islam. To the true, genuine, authentic, qualified students of knowledge. Because a lot of them, they, they are not openly sharing their knowledge. Please do your job 
and lead your community because we have a lot of sufaha and ruwaybida and unqualified people leading the Muslims nowadays, leading them to, again, to problems, to fitan. People who have, you know, lots of followers online, but they have no knowledge whatsoever. They have no hikmah. Some of them don't even work for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. They have turned this religion into a business. They are just benefiting from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to those people who are qualified, who have the ilm, please, please do your job and spread the nasiha to the other Muslims. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us. Nasr Allah ta'ala an yataqabbala minna wa minkum salih al-a'mal. And please do not forget, again, to share this video. This is a very important nasiha. I hope you have enjoyed it and that it was beneficial. If you have any comments or questions, please make sure to write them down, inshallah, because as you know, that's how social media, they work nowadays. If people don't write any comments, I'm not looking for comments for myself. I'm not looking for appreciation or for encouragement. It's just because when people, they write comments, the more you write comments, the more this is going to be exposed and offered to other viewers. Jazakumullahu ta'ala khayran, subhanakallahu wa bihamdik, ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk, wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.